What's happening, everybody? This is V3Cast, episode 18, the official Voyager 3 podcast. This is a special edition, guys. Do you want to know why? Why is that? It's October, and it's spooky time, Halloween. This is one of our episodes that's going to happen in October. So, um, man, I'm feeling festive. We got our Halloween decorations up out front, and there's nice leaves rustling on the ground. A lot of leaves are changing colors. It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. I got these um, these sunglasses I got in the mail. I don't know who they came from. I think it might have been one of our like people who watch the podcast or something. But I got these sunglasses just yesterday in the mail. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So I got sunglasses in the mail too, and I didn't. I didn't order them. I don't even no, know where they came from. Either I didn't order these. So it must be. Uh, it must be a podcast people uh, sending it, right? So so wait a minute. Somebody sending you guys sunglasses. I didn't get any. What the hell? What in the... Bryce. What? What's going on here? What? What? I don't know what you're talking about. What's uh, going on here? Aaron? We've got two that can see. All right, so we're in the Halloween spirit, and uh, I got to know, what are y'all drinking? Aaron's going first. All right. I got uh, a new one for me. I found this Lord of the Rings IPA. Oh man, God. it's cool. Love that. Uh, yeah, it's cool. It's uh, it's good too. Um, that's Brudog like officially did, licensed. Yes, officially. <laughs> Brewdog did an Iron Maiden beer too, the Hellcat beer I had a little while ago with the crazy Liger on it or whatever. Um, and so this is their uh, Lord of the Rings IPA. It's great. Dig it, man. You know, I got. You know, I got to go find that now, right? Right. Aaron? I mean, you're trying to out, you're trying to outdo me, and I don't yeah. like it. <laughs> you you threw down the gauntlet a few uh, while ago, and I was like really letting you down with my uh, redundant <laughs> drink choices. So I was like, all right, I'll show him. I can be, I can be a real man. I can get good stuff. Right. So yeah, right. Aaron went to that Iron Maiden concert and came back with uh, beers, you know, from the gods, basically. Good, That's good right. going. Good for you. He's got that crispy new Iron Maiden shirt on. Mm -hmm. Is that is that brand new? First time wearing it. That show looked fun. I saw some YouTube footage of it, and it looked like it was absolutely amazing. More props than props got props with a huge plane uh, floating above the drum kit. Oh man, awesome! We uh, wormed our way up to the front of the stage. We were like just about six feet from the barrier, if that. So it was the closest I've ever been to them, and uh, I could see every wrinkle on their faces it was awesome <laughs> yeah man <laughs> did you get any souvenirs there so at the end of the show uh adrian smith my favorite guitarist in the band threw out his wristband my wife caught it and gave it directly to me so there it is oh, adrian man. smith so no, that's that's real deal. yeah that uh that's a how once in a lifetime thing how does it smell it's it smells like the man's sweat it smells like British sweat. It's great. <laughs> it's awesome. I wore it for about three days afterwards. All right. So here's uh, what I'm drinking. Sweet water, hazy IPA. It's from Georgia. Oh, nice. It doesn't have a fancy can, but it's pretty right. good. Cool. It, I'd say I call this, you know, right down the middle. Not not overly anything. Well, right. It's really with that color you know, scheme. Just kind of. Kind of average, <laughs> but still good. So good. With, with that color scheme and uh, design, it makes me kind of think of summertime. Yeah. Now I'm drinking it out of Steve's glass. Oh, yeah, from well, after actually, goddamn. Actually, Jill's glass that she got me. <laughs> right. Let's give credit, the proper credit. That's right. I didn't go this time. All right. I have a, uh, a favorite of mine that I just discovered because I was afraid to try their new flavors. But uh, Red Bull Berry Coconut. Now I know oh, I know what you're thinking. What, uh, what is this fr- fruity uh, stuff? But it uh, is absolutely delicious. Are you ready? I'm gonna crack it. Oh yeah! How does Aaron feel about that? It's the coconut want, oh, that bothers me. The coconut bothers. Want, Aaron does not like other flavors in the Red Bull. The coconut is my favorite part of it, man. I'm sorry. What? I, I got news for you. It's, it's absolutely fun, delicious, different. It's its own thing, and they have like uh, three or four other flavors, like in that line. Um, I haven't tried them yet, but uh, 
my brother Sam said, man, try that coconut. And I'm like, okay. And I've been getting it ever since. All right, we're going to talk about a very cool short film that we had the honor of contributing music to. Uh, this film came out in 2015. It premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival, and it is called Portal to Hell. And it was Roddy Piper's, the late, great Roddy Piper's final short film. And uh, it was so much fun to be involved with it. And uh, they did such a good job on it. It's kind of like a comedy and horror uh, and maybe some supernatural, right? Would you say? Because it's got a lot of Cthulhu sure. and H.P. Lovecraft themes. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it was directed by uh, Viviano Caldinelli and written by Matt Watts. And another cool um, uh, person of note is that uh, Stephen Kostansky did all of the visual effects. And some of you might know uh, Stephen Kostansky from like Manborg and uh, Psycho Gorman. And he also just did a couple episodes of that Day of the Dead series that came out last year. Uh, so he's been busy. Uh, Viviano's been busy too. He, he did a film called uh, Seven Stages to Achieve Eternal Bliss. And he also did some uh, sketch comedy stuff since then. But uh, we want to talk about Portal to Hell tonight. But what's yeah, some of your guys' was... cool memories of that? Well, for me, like Rowdy Roddy Piper is one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. When I first started watching wrestling as a kid, it was like really into the Hulk Hogan era. Um, and I, I mean, I liked Hulk Hogan like every kid did, but I really liked Piper. I, I was kind of intrigued by how mean he was. And as a little kid, like you don't, you don't know that it's an act. So, and plus for him, it might not have been that much of an act, right. but, um, yeah. Piper hated Mr. T until the day he died, as far as I know. Um, oh. but, uh, I thought he was cool. He looked cool with the kilt. And he had Piper's Pit. He was he's one of the best talkers in the history of, of the business up there with, uh, you know, with Ric Flair and The Rock and Stone Cold Steve Austin. So I've always loved Piper. Right. And and so to be associated with him in any way, to be doing the music for a movie that he was in, whether it was a full length or a short, was like super, super cool. That was great. Oh, yeah. Um, now, you guys have to help me out with this one because I, I know the bit and I know all what happened, but I don't remember who the other wrestler was. But one of my all-time favorite and earliest memories of Roddy Piper was the promo he did on Piper's Pit where he just kicked the shit out of this one wrestler <laughs> and he like jammed a banana in his face and hit him over the head with a coconut and yeah. all this stuff. What wrestler was that? That was Jimmy Superfly Snooker. Okay, gotcha. And, and I that saw was that like, live, and I was like, oh, what is it. going on? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think anybody knew what was going on because they didn't plan it all out, you know? He, he kind of, I, I, I knew, I think Snuka knew that he was going to hit him with the coconut, but the coconut was supposed to be scored. Yeah, They were supposed to work it out where it was supposed to be, you know, softened up and break apart with the <laughs> slight fit, but they didn't score it. They, di they either didn't score it or they didn't do a good job of it at all. So I think, and I think Piper could tell beforehand because it was too heavy or something. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, I, we're going to, we're going to roll in a few minutes. I got to hit him with this thing. So he did and, oh and hit him hard. <laughs> and, um, I think he, right at the same time, he had to stop him from really passing out because that would kill the segment. So, you know, there he's fighting, he's beating the hell out of him, and yeah, the bananas and everything. It was great, and, and Snooker did not know it was going to be that bad. So right, right, yeah, I love Classic. that. Yep, I remember loving Jimmy Superfly Snooker. Yeah, he's one of the all-time greats too, as far first as first especially... high flyer that yeah. I got into. You know, yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, Piper uh, in in Portal to Hell, he didn't. He, I don't think Piper is the kind of guy who ever like half did anything. You know, and, and even though this was a short film, they were making it with the intention of getting winning this this contest and then making a full length. So that's not like you phoned it in at all. And um, and he was really cool in it. And um, and, uh, and, you know, kind of in a way, it kind of reminds me of um, Phantasm as far as like getting that, that that portal to that other world when they finally see what's going on on the other side. And it's all crazy beyond what you would have imagined yeah. in such a little, it's like this little apartment building basement, you know, and then it, and then it shows the other side and it's this whole other dimension. So that reminds me of uh phantasm, how, when they, when they take a look through that other side and it just looks 
insane, you know? It's 12 minutes of like pure bliss because it's like written so well and so clever. Mm -hmm. And like, there's a lot of things that they, well, that, that they're able to accomplish in 12 minutes. Like you just don't like when you, uh, 12 minutes is obviously very short, but when you get to the end of it, you're like, you just don't want it to end. Right. And, and I remember the biggest rush for me was, you know, this was sort of the first thing that, that somebody licensed our music for. And, uh, I remember like, I know it's kind of faux pas to like film in a movie theater, but somebody on Instagram or something roll the camera right as the credits came up, which I guess they felt was like an appropriate time. And like the, the thought, the thing I heard was like our song kick in right on the, on that first credit. Mm -hmm. And like the whole place started clapping and, and cheering. And, you know, like for us being film nerds and musicians that have been trying to do this for so long to have that to, you know, I only saw it virtually, but to finally have that was was amazing you know what i mean and yeah for sure man for sure he was great in it too by the way like every part that he's in you know like is total piper through yeah. the whole thing yeah. it's just like i said it's pure bliss it's it's 12 minute it's it's perfect yeah oh, yeah and uh matt watts who wrote it and also stars in it he uh he plays um kind of the comic uh, relief character. What, uh, have his so name. high. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> no. Oh, is he that guy? Yeah, has a phobia of heights. <laughs> Doesn't and, he uh, have to climb like a two foot? <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to get the axe. Yeah, he's like, oh, to it's too axe, high so. with his Canadian accent. I just <laughs> love it. It's perfect. So, now, how cool is all that character development? These little bullet points of every person yeah. you know, little things about them. All you their know, hangups. Yeah, and and you know that uh, Jenny w- had a divorce, and you know she's kind of lonely, and and, yeah. and Roddy Piper's character Jack helped <laughs> her out, gave her that toaster, and <laughs> it's so good, man. So it's like good. the and it, it's a master class, I think, on being able to like give all these characters um, a, a little bit of uh, atmosphere and and, yeah. and 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 character development uh, in a, such a short time. It's perfect. And to their credit, Viv's credit and Matt's credit, like you care more about those characters in 12 minutes than I care about some characters in a full length movie, you know, very true. Yeah. I I was, I mean, every one of them is totally sold. Like you, you just believe that they're that person, you know, it's just so good. And, uh, Matheson and King in the basement, these kooky old men in their underwear with, uh, you know, tribal writing on their bodies. What's going on here? Right. (laughs) And, uh, it was one of the things that I thought was really innovative i don't know if innovative is the right word but when we made we made this was a song they use uh uh guanto nero and um you know but but the way they use it it sounds like we wrote it specifically for the movie it sounds like it was written for the scene um because they used it so well and then they even used it in a comedic way which i wasn't expecting um when when they opened the portal and it it blasts in with the beginning of our song this is like huge you know, huge synthesizer notes, and then they close the portal and it stops. And then they open it again, bang! And so it blasts you, and I was like, oh my God, how did they think of that? You know, it makes it sound like it was written specifically for that scene, but really it's just them thinking of a great way to to twist that song around. And, and uh, so I was really impressed by that, too. Yeah, as far I'm as- almost positive that was Viv's idea, because when we were going back and forth on the email about little notes and changes, I'm pretty sure that he said that. That's it's awesome. perfect absolutely perfect yeah. for sure yeah so you can i know i know you can i know steve you're probably going to mention that you can find it on youtube and you definitely can and that's probably where most people will find it yeah that's probably the easiest way to find it but it's also on i told you guys it's on that canopy platform oh, right with your library card right yeah so some people will have access to canopy through their library and, i believe so if you're so it's on for canopy it, like, and then we'll link the youtube uh, right. in, in the description of this video of this uh, podcast. Yeah, so, so if you haven't seen it, you should definitely go. I mean, it's 12 minutes. Come on. There's no, right. there's no excuse. You owe that to Rowdy Rowdy Piper. That's it's right. Rowdy Rowdy Piper's last film. Let's, let's, uh, let's support yeah. it. Yeah, right. And I don't know if I ever told you guys, but I, you know how we got the, um, the portal to hell, like 12 by 12 little, I don't know what it is. It's like a, it's almost, almost like, like a flat. A, or maybe I just had you make me one, Steve. I don't remember what it was. But anyhow, I took that to a Comic-Con that 
Piper was going to be at. So I got him to actually sign it and I explained who I was and like, you know, how like, you know, stoked we were to be even like a small part of, of the project. And, and he was laughing and, and telling me like, you know, some typical rowdy, rowdy Piper stuff <laughs> um, no. about the, about the shoot. And then he signed it to me. And, uh, so I have that. And then shortly after that, we found out that he passed away. So, yeah. That's awesome, man. That's so I got cool to, to meet him that. like one, meet him one last time and tell him, you know, that I was involved in the project. So it was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, that's perfect. That's perfect. As we mentioned earlier, this is October. It is the spooky month with Halloween and other such fun things. So we wanted to have a little segment where we talk about uh, three Halloween or horror type film picks from us to you. So uh, this give you something to watch if you haven't seen any of these, or if you share in the opinion that these are classics, then cool. Aaron, what you got? Uh, let's see here. Um, I wanted to do some, I think, stuff that I hadn't talked about before. Because, you know, we talk about some stuff, and sometimes we hit on, on movies more than once, you know. Well, yeah. Stuff just comes up. But I wanted to challenge myself at least at least in my head i don't think i've talked about these before so first one is session nine uh it's one of my favorite movies certainly one of oh, my favorite good one. horror Hell movies yeah. um it's from 2001 it's directed by brad anderson who went on to do the machinist with christian bale and um and other stuff too and it's one of the scariest movies i've ever seen i remember mm -hmm. once the first time i was watching it i was watching it by myself so when we lived in Hamtramck and I'm sitting there in my room watching this movie, so freaked out, so invested in it all the way in. And my phone rang and I was so happy that my phone rang because it gave me a break from this movie for a few <laughs> seconds to like get my, cause it's, it's all about this insane asylum that these guys are going into to do hazmat removal. And then as soon as they go in there, these weird things start happening. These weird things are in their heads. Um, or you don't know if it's in their head or if it's really there. Um, you know, insane asylums, abandoned insane asylums are the scariest thing in the world. Yeah. Uh, I and they find tapes too, right? If I'm, oh, yeah. if I'm remembering yeah. right. The sessions are these tapes that this guy finds, these real to real tapes, uh, sessions with this woman who was crazy and, um, and this is her therapy sessions and, you know, he's going through them, right? So what's going to happen when he gets to session nine? That's the name of the movie. So you're <laughs> wondering what's going to be on those tapes. It's just an amazing Awesome, scary movie. David Caruso is in it. A bunch of people you'd know uh, from a bunch of stuff. Yeah, I was so relieved that the phone rang for a minute so it could take me out of that world. <laughs> um, the uh, second one for me is a movie called Thirst from 1979, directed by Rod Hardy, who did a lot of TV stuff other than this. I mean, he did some movies. He's a, it's an Australian horror movie. It was uh, one of the earliest movies I remember seeing as a kid. And it's, you know, it's that, that age where you don't even know what you're really seeing, but you remember these images and how creepy they are. And it's, it's this cult of, they're not vampires, but they want to be vampires. They want to drink blood and stuff. It brings in this corporate, side to this cult and they have farms with people walking around that are brainwashed and they're like milking their blood they're keeping them alive so they can keep taking their blood you know and they they hmm. freaking box it up in cartons like milk cartons and stuff so they've never seen this before to this, this crazy. yeah there, there are people around the world that are getting this 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 blood in the shape of milk cartons and uh they kidnap this lady and tell her that she's the descendant of countess Elizabeth Bathory. So little does she know she needs to be with them. She needs to join them. And, um, you know, so they're trying to brainwash her and stuff and she's trying to resist. Um, it, it's a great movie. Uh, Henry Silva is in it. Didn't he just die? Yeah, he did. He's in it. Um, uh, and then when I was older and I saw it again, I was able to understand it more than I could as a kid. My third pick is Halloween three, which I only saw yesterday for the first time ever. Uh, as a kid, I avoided it because it didn't have Michael Myers in it. And I didn't understand what the deal was with it. Aaron. Um, so yeah, well, no, you know, I, I was yeah, dumb. When you texted that, I couldn't believe, I didn't even. Me either. I couldn't I, believe you. I just glazed it. over the text because I'm like, that's not what he was talking about. He must be talking right. about something else. What, whatever. Next. <laughs> well, yeah. When we were in LA last year, like just about a year ago, when we were in the hotel room and that movie was on, I was like making myself not watch it because I didn't want to see it all out of context. I wanted to just wait and watch it all together yeah so i watched it yesterday with my kid and we both loved it and um it was it was great 
Yeah. You know? Yeah. Somebody made somebody made an interesting point about that movie recently and said uh, if it had just been called Season of the Witch and dropped the Halloween, oh yeah, I've been saying that it, for years. Yeah. yeah, it would have been a, it would have been accepted and a cult. Well, I mean, it is a cult favorite now, but like it would have at always the time been. it would have gone over better had yeah. it not been tied. So you know, everybody's expecting Michael Myers, you know? So when they didn't get it, it sort of cursed that film, unfortunately. And, and And, and technically he is in it. Well, yeah. Those little TV (laughs) TV clips. Yeah. Um, (laughs) That what's so, what's so great about it. Like I just said about thirst and that corporate thing that they bring in it, you know, people don't trust corporations. You got that with silver shamrock, you know, the, the ultimate evil corporate thing they're doing and 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 normally in a in a movie, even a horror movie, you go well. Well, they're not going to kill the kid, you know. They're going to kill a bunch of teenagers. They're not going to kill a little kid. Well, this movie is like specifically that's all they want to do is kill kids. That's yeah. crazy. That's crazy that, that even got through the you know the writing stage, you know. And and, uh, and uh, I applaud it. I applaud it. I play the Halloween three soundtrack almost more than I play like I have the original Halloween and. Um, a few of the other, you know, the more modern ones, obviously anything John Carpenter does really, but I play Halloween three more than any of them. So my kids like know the, the dun, 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 yeah. dun, you know, two more days till Halloween. Like my kids <laughs> love, like they walk around singing it and they have no idea that it's like such a twisted, yeah. you know, weird thing that yeah, they're involved in because <laughs> right. of their dad. All right. Well, speaking of that, Greg, <clears throat> what are your three picks? All right, so I get criticized by uh, Aaron quite a bit because I spend a lot of my time in the 80s. And <laughs> so I decided to make him happy more <laughs> more so than anybody else. So I have a classic October pick. I have a modern horror classic October pick. And then I also have a brand new October pick. All right. All right, so I'm going to start with the classic, which... Shouldn't surprise anyone, anybody who listens to this podcast, Poltergeist. Nice. Toby Hooper. That that's like so I, I'm I'm calling this my classic October pick because this is this to me is like back to the future. If it's on, I'll never turn it off. Like mm-hmm. I, it's just a comfort, scary movie. It's like the first ghost movie that really like, you know, scared the hell out of me. You know, between mm-hmm. the clown and the tree and the pool in the backyard and there's just oh, yeah. so many things about this movie that are terrifying as a kid. And uh, I felt like this was a good one to mention because they just recently released it in 4K, too. So, like, if you're, you know, into collecting movies, you know, it just came out in 4K and I'm, I, I'm dying to see it in 4K. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, why not? All right. So, my modern horror October pick is It Follows 2014. Oh, yeah. I loved yeah. it. Loved it. David David Roch, Robert Mitchell directed it. Uh, a lot of it was shot here in Michigan. So yeah, like he's a Detroiter. This, yeah, it has this weird like I have this like thing about that movie. It's another one where like it'll be on and I'll just I, I'm I'm immediately like into it. Like I can just watch it over and over again. I don't get tired of it. And it's and it's probably because I recognize a lot of the neighborhoods and the landmarks, but right. it's it's another uh great and I'll call that a modern horror film because Aaron knows it wasn't filmed in the eighties, even though <laughs> it's supposed to look like an eighties movie, I guess but right. we'll let that go. And then my brand new October pick that I think everybody should go watch is uh dead stream. And it's on shutter just came out 2022. And it was, uh, get this, the guy, I think it was the guy and his wife, Joseph and Vanessa winter wrote, directed, edited, and Joseph did the music and he was the main star. Oh, wow. So like, I mean, you know, his fingerprints and her fingerprints are all over it. So, yeah. uh, I know I, I texted you guys about this movie, but, and I know other people have said this, so it's not unique to me, but like, it does give you like evil dead vibes. So like, you know, the humor aspect of the evil dead movies, especially yeah. part two. Yeah. Um, if you like that, you know, like it's definitely, pretty well done and uh he's great as the main like the main actor is great and uh really really sells it those are my three picks and nice. two of them were not from the 80s aaron That's there you right. go That's good right. job good job man <clears throat> branching out solid picks well 
you know we're all in the same band, so we're going to have uh, similar mindsets. So my mindset uh, went a little bit toward what Greg just said about trying to not have everything from the 80s because it was such a great era for horror. Mm-hmm. And I have one pick that Aaron picked because, I mean, you know, you, you can't avoid it. So that, that's okay, though. Yeah. So, so my first pick is uh, the original Phantasm, 1979, uh, directed by Don Coscarelli. So as you were saying earlier, Aaron, when they look through that portal and they see the other world that uh, those little uh, demons are from and where the tall man's from, what a villain, the tall man, and the, yeah. the crazy spheres that go through the mausoleum. Just, there's so many layers of awesome creepiness, and at that time, super original. I mean, even to this day, um, there's really nothing like Phantasm. It has its own culture and, and vibe, and you know, of course, there was five films total in the uh, franchise. Uh, Dynamite, recommended to anybody to watch all of them, but um, first one, very, very cool. How about the part when he's walking through the town in slow motion, mm-hmm. he's just, like tromping through the town, and the kid sees him, and then he turns around to him. I mean, and, yeah. and he, it's great because he's out in broad daylight too, you know, like yes. just right in town. It's not like he's trapped in that in the uh, in the funeral home and nobody ever sees him leave. No, he'll walk right into town. He doesn't yep. even care. So, <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. And he, when he walks through, like the ice cream uh, smoke is coming out. Not smoke, but you know, the steam, with, the, with, the, the, with fog. the defrosting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and he walks right through that, and that's kind of, I think that's in slow motion too. It's just ultra creepy and right. yeah they they so did good. such a good job with that with all those films man for sure definitely <clears throat> and then uh halloween three season of the witch 1982 directed by tommy lee wallace um that you you talked about it aaron a minute ago and such a great film but at the time correct most people were like uh what happened why is there no michael myers and people right. panned it and didn't like it um i i don't think i didn't see that one in the theaters i saw it later like on tv or hbo or whatever and uh i don't know if i thought really too much anything of it uh back then when i was a kid but then you know as time passed maybe in the mid 90s or early 90s and i saw it when i was a little older um i've always liked it and didn't care that it didn't have michael myers in it because i remember reading an interview with uh john carpenter where he was talking about yeah we originally wanted to have halloween be like an anthology where it would just be whatever uh, happening um, in, in, in each installment, all kinds of different stuff. Um, but I, I guess since Halloween was so successful, the producers made them do like a proper sequel. So then that probably locked them in, obviously, to that. So they could never not have Michael Myers again. <laughs> um, yeah, I think he envisioned it like Creepshow was right. kind of, you know, that's, like different that's stories. That's what I gather, yeah. Yeah, which is cool. I mean, that's kind of how the Friday the 13th uh, TV series was. Um, mm-hmm. If you guys remember that from like the late 80s, I think. Yeah. That was just kind of like sort of like a Twilight Zone, sort of, right. you know. Um, and it was cool. Um, the music's cool, and a lot of those episodes were awesome. I haven't seen them in a while, but um, that's one I should revisit, speaking of yeah. that. Um, it's probably on Shudder. Yeah, I, wouldn't, I would not be surprised for sure. If it's not on Shudder, it's definitely on Tubi. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. And then, and then my third pick, uh, tried to go for something a little bit more modern, The Haunting of Hill House, which was uh, from 2018 as a series that's on Netflix. I'm pretty sure Netflix, uh, directed by Mike Flanagan, who also did like Dr. Sleep and uh, Midnight Mass, which is another series that's on right now on one of the streaming services. Aaron liked that one. Let me tell you, just let me tell you how good The Haunting of Hill House made nightmares come to life in my opinion um so i haven't even seen every episode but i've seen a sprinkling of them and every time i i'm, I'm watching i'll walk into the room and it'll be on and uh, i'll see this this segment where there's this creepy floating guy going down the hallway like looking in every door and the kids have to hide under the bed all the stuff that you were terrified of as a kid or had nightmares of they nailed it and they made it come to life on 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 the screen that's such a great job and it's really high High caliber series, and it right. has Elliot from ET in it. They cast him in there, so really cool. Cool, and he's in. He worked with him again in Midnight Mass. He's oh uh, okay. He's a, he is a dad in Midnight Mass, actually. There you go. Um, nice. I uh, yeah, I didn't realize it was the same creator. I do. I watched the first. I think the first episode of of, of Haunting, 
and uh, I liked it. But for you know, sometimes things just slip through the cracks, and I never kept up with it. But right. I got to go back to that and and uh, dig into it. Well, this is the guys, month for it. It's October. Yeah. Come on, <laughs> I will. I'll do it. You guys need to do Midnight Mass though, because that was awesome. Yeah, I'll watch that. Now, sure. Aaron, Aaron, when are you getting that Shutter subscription? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna actually. Yeah, this is the year. I'm gonna get it. Gonna <laughs> this get is it. my year. Yeah. This is my year. Mailbag. I have a real short mailbag. Um, we had some cool comments last time. Uh, the one I wanted to mention is uh, from Trembling Colors. We were talking about Fear City, and Greg recommended it to us, and I watched it. It was awesome. Did you see it, Steve? I've seen half of it, and I have to, I have to watch the, the second half yet, but it's super cool. Yeah, it was cool. I, I think I watched it the night we did the podcast. I went straight upstairs. So and cool. Watched. Yeah, I watched Fear City. And so Trembling Colors was talking about a bunch of movies along those same lines. Um, Abel Ferreira is who directed uh, Fear City. And so he mentioned some other ones from him, like King of New York, um, Miss 45, and Driller Killer. I, I don't know if he did all those, but I know he did King of New York. Yeah, I've been... I've been meaning to see Miss Forty Five. I know, like they some one of those boutique labels put out the the score to that. And yeah, that was definitely one of those back in the day. Yeah. yeah, it's on my it's on my radar. I gotta watch that one. Yeah, and he also mentioned Alphabet City. He uh, from the, from nineteen eighty four. He said that it, he he really loves it, and he said it's a movie that he could see us doing like music for, like you know, a rescore or something, yeah. or like he said even taking images hopefully not getting sued and taking images from the movie and put, and making a video for one of our songs with it, you know, something like that. But right, right. so it made him think of us, which is really cool. So nice. um, thank you. Trembling colors. We are going to check out. He, he listed more than those movies. He listed like seven movies. So we I, are know, going I wrote to them all down too. Yeah, I wrote every gonna, single one down. Yeah. We're going to watch as many as we can. Oh and, yeah. We uh, got a, a long list of stuff to check out. That's one of the yeah. beauties of this podcast is that, we tell you guys about cool stuff, but believe it or not, we learn a lot of cool stuff too. So we're making lists and trying to knock them out as much as possible. That's right. All right. We have some Voyager 3 news to get uh, through here. We're contributing a horror themed cover song to this compilation album, uh, which goes along with a video documentary about horror film scores. And it's done by Scored to Death. Uh, they have a Kickstarter now that will put the link into the, the description. And there's other awesome artists on there, like Alan Haworth. Everybody knows him from a lot of the John Carpenter scores. Uh, Steve Moore from Zombie. And uh, Richard Christie, who played uh, drums in the uh, Final Death album. And he also Richard, has a band. Richard Christie's going to be in it? Yep. Yeah. He's yeah. my favorite. I, mean, I, I don't know what he's going to do. It's going to be really off the wall because, I mean, is it going to be metal or what? Man, I don't know. It's going to be great. Stern fan. He's, that, one of the best, he's one of the best drummers in the world. I'll just put yeah. that out. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Andy's yeah, on Howard Stern. There's a whole handful of artists on there, and, and we're, <laughs> we're one of them. So um, it's basically a companion album that's going to go along with the documentary, and uh, we're going to do a cover song of a sweet horror film. Are so we Steve, telling me, what we're doing, or are we, no, are we waiting? No, it's, oh, all, it's all on lockdown. We're not telling you what we're doing yet. <laughs> Steve, let me get this straight. We're contributing a song that Alan Howarth, Steve Moore, From and Zombie? Richard Christie are also doing. Are, yeah. are also, so that's, that's uh, the fact, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> all right, another bit of news is that, uh, for those of you who have not heard yet, New York Ninja is getting a sequel comic book and that comes out on november 30th uh so any place where you get comic books check it out or ask them to order it and uh, it comes out on the 30th and in celebration of that voyager 3 is playing a free concert inside comics and more in madison heights michigan on saturday december 3rd and we're going to be playing some songs from our score to new york ninja as well as all of our other records so you don't want to miss this one last bit I have for you. We were talking about Shudder, and we're talking about October and scary movies. Did you guys know that Occhiali Neri is now on Shudder? It's official, and I watched it. Man, it's so good. It's totally everything yeah, that I wanted my, it to be. It's on my watch list. 
I gotta, totally I gotta find the time, Steve. Great job. Because some some of Dario Argento's more modern films, they just don't resonate with me as much as the older stuff. This one totally nails it. Um, it's great. I totally recommend it. It's on Shutter. Stream it t- uh, tonight. Is it on other oh. stuff too? No, or just Shutter? no, just Shutter. They have the exclusive see, release Aaron. for now. Yeah, see, this is what, I'm, ta- to- this is what I'm talking about. I need that Shutter, man. <laughs> Can you, this is your can year. You, this is your year. Maybe I'm right. going to get it for you for Christmas. I don't know. <laughs> I might have to just like step in. <laughs> can you get can it I buy it? a Shutter gift card? Can I? Can <laughs> I think I you can do that. You? What if you got me one month and I'm like, oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Aaron, it's stay up 24 hours for one month. Right. The rest is up to you, man. I'm just getting you started. Yeah. You That's have right. to stream every Joe Bob episode in one month. <laughs> right. So with this topic, um, I thought, you know, we talk a lot on this podcast about stuff we love, which is, that's normal for us. We, we don't tend to talk about stuff we don't like. We don't tend to argue on here or anything, anything like that. Um, so we ended up talking about a lot of cool things that we're really into and we love. And I thought, oh, what if we flipped it a little bit every once in a while and um, explored the other side? So I wanted to talk about a super personally disappointing movie a movie that you were like really looking forward to that you were personally invested in and um you saw it and it just crushed you because it was so bad um so most disappointing movie uh why don't you go first steve okay uh for me i didn't have to think long and hard at all it is 2017 star wars the last jedi uh it totally crushed (laughs) <laughs> All of my liking for Star Wars. Look at Aaron. Look I've, at Aaron. Been, yeah. I've been a Star Wars fan my whole entire life. I have a Star Wars tattoo. I've seen all the movies countless times. I had all the toys. I have posters. I have everything you can imagine. I know most of the dialogue by heart. I even know sound effects by heart. And, I, and if you play me little blips of certain things, I could probably tell you which film it's from. All that deep dive stuff. What was the one before The Last Jedi? The Force Awakens. When The Force Awakens came out, I thought it was a great kind of return to that whole world, um, even though it was, you know, a lot of a retelling of A New Hope. But I still thought that was okay. You know, they didn't want to take a lot of chances, I guess, and they wanted to just kind of be safe and tell a story, uh, you know, in that way. That's okay. I, w- I was cool with that. So for those of you have, who have seen uh, The Force Awakens, you know how it ends. Uh, you don't see Luke Skywalker for the whole entire film, and you see him for the final five seconds and um ray holds out his lightsaber to him monumental moment right you 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 waited the whole film to see that and uh then it ends cliffhanger right you know oh my god what's gonna happen so now fast forward to the last jedi they start it right there and he takes it and he throws it away uh so that was my first inkling that we were going to be in trouble with with this movie (laughs) um now i will say killing your cousin steve I'm sorry, Aaron. Look at him. He's in pain. I I will say that I think Ryan Johnson's a great filmmaker. I love Knives Out. I liked Looper. I think I've probably seen one or two other of his films. I just don't think he should be anywhere near a Star Wars film. For, you know, why he did this, I have no idea. Well, actually, I do have an idea. I think that uh, with all the speculation and some people being right and all the hoopla of people who do YouTube channels and have blogs on the internet. There was a whole bunch of, for months and months and months of people speculating who Snoke was, what's going to happen in the film. And I, I think that it just got to him somehow. So when he was writing this film, he, he, he put above all else that I'm going to make it so you don't know what's going to happen or I'm, you know, I'm going to uh, be unpredictable. Uh, you know, but there's a saying called cut your nose off to spite your face. And I believe that's what he did because um, why would you handle the lightsaber in that way? when the whole buildup of the previous film was so much to, to, to see what's going to happen with that. Then he just, you know, takes a shit on it, in my opinion. And then another huge, unbelievably dumb part is that you kill your main bad guy through, halfway through the film. And I, I've only seen it twice because I, I just, it disgusts me so much that I, I probably don't even want to watch it again. He's, well, he's we don't, not, get, we don't not, get candid Steve like this very often. He's not he's, the main bad guy. Um, oh, but, oh, I, see, now you I guys, believe now you guys I, are going to debate. I believe he was the way that he was handled in the Force Awakens. 
uh, so powerful, being able to do stuff you've never seen with the Force before, you know, hold a hologram from across the, a, the galaxy and uh, affect people with the Force when he's not even around. That was stuff that you've never seen before uh, in Star Wars. So, he, so they were automatically setting him up to be more powerful than anything you've seen yet. So I believe they were putting a lot of weight on him and having him be, you know, a whole, oh my God, bad guy. This is, you know, even, is he more powerful than the Emperor or whatever? You know, kind of raising questions like that. So when you kill your main bad guy through the, before the second acts over in, 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 in the second film of a trilogy, I could feel the film flounder afterwards. I honestly could. I, and, I, and I was like, well, what are you, what are you even going to do now? And then so fast forward to the third film, they didn't even know what to do because what's left? You kind of just like wrote yourself into a corner. The paint's not dry and you're painted into the corner. So they bring the emperor back which totally shits on all of Return of the Jedi and the whole original trilogy struggle and the whole redemption of <laughs> Vader and all this kind of thing. And they just bring him back like it's no big deal. And, and with, with three lines of dialogue, oh, it's dark Jedi voodoo or whatever he says that the guy from who started and lost said so quick and willy-nilly like that. Uh, I just don't buy it, man. So that film disappointed the ever-loving shit out of me and it made me not even care about Star Wars until... Uh, the the uh, the television series that started airing on Disney Plus, like uh, Book of Boba Fett, The Mandalorian, and things like that, that kind of got me back into mainly The Mandalorian. Kind of. What ma- about Rogue Mandalorian. One, Steve? I think Rogue One. Was, I'm not sure when that came out in the series of things, so I don't know if that was before. I think that was before that stuff, it wasn't was it? Before it was yeah. before. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I liked Rogue One. It was it was fine. I'm looking forward to seeing. Andor, which I know is kind of related to that bubble. Um, I haven't seen them yet. I know it's out, but I haven't had time to, to watch it yet. But uh, yeah, that film killed me. Now I will, I'm, I try to be as fair as I possibly can. As terrible as that film was, I think it had one of the absolute coolest Star Wars bits in any Star Wars film, is when Luke was a hologram that whole time fighting uh, Kylo Ren. I remember I grabbed Aaron's pant leg and shook his pants real quick, like hard. I probably scared him in, in, in the theater when that was like revealed. I'm like, oh, coolest shit ever. But the rest of the train wreck of writing to me didn't say, you know, that wasn't savable in my opinion. So uh, The Last Jedi was the most disappointing film I've ever seen. What's funny to me, and I'm not, obviously you have your right to your opinion, so I'm not going to argue about it with you. Um, and we've talked about it many times. What blew me away the most is that we saw the movie together. You did grab my leg, you know, when, when that happened. So I'm thinking the whole, okay, for me watching the movie, I'm like, Oh fuck, this is great. Like every scene, every, every minute of the movie, right. I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe they killed Snoke. Fuck Snoke. I let him be killed. Everything. I was, I was there for everything they did. I was like, I loved its unpredictable unpredictability. I loved all that stuff. And so then, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, this is so great. And we get out of the theater and I look over at you. I'm like, huh? And you're like, I feel like I'm going to puke right now, basically. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about? You grabbed my leg. Uh, so I couldn't, I, it was the first time in all of our years, you know, we grew up together on, with Star Wars and we always agreed about all of it we we agreed even that we liked the prequels at first and then the time went by and we start we stopped liking them and um we agreed that the third prequel was the only good one that kind of thing (laughs) um so when we you know up all the ups and downs of star wars and when we got to that one i couldn't believe that we had such difference of opinion i kind of still don't believe it but um (laughs) but yeah that's uh i knew you were going to pick that one of course when when i thought about this topic um but yeah, there you go. It's uh, it, it saddens me. Personally. <laughs> you killed your cousin, Steve. <laughs> that we had to have um, that we had to have such a big disagreement about Star Wars. It made me sad. But with so much Star <laughs> Wars content right now, now we've gotten into such a saturation of Star Wars content that it's almost like it almost doesn't matter anymore because it's not all going to be golden. You know, right, there's so right. much Star Wars stuff. Some of it's going to be great. Some of it's not. And like, it's, it's, it has less impact to me now that you don't dig that one because there's just so much stuff going on. Uh, what about you, Greg? Well, mine is not completely unrelated to like a star Wars. It's a, it's a major franchise. Uh, Indiana Jones, 
and the kingdom of the crystal skull. Yeah. I just remember being so hyped that they were going to do another one. And mm-hmm. They finally got Harrison Ford to do it. You know, he was reluctant to do it. And, yeah. you know, Steven Spielberg was directing it. So I'm like, man, this is going to be a home run. It's going to, yeah. yeah, how can it not be good? I know the whole recipe is there for success, basically. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, man, was I wrong? <laughs> I was just, I couldn't even, like, I don't know. I just I only saw it once. So I, you know, but then maybe that's saying something too that I've only seen it once. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I just remember being, I kind of had the same feeling Steve did. I'm like, I just don't even understand what is going on right now. Like, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom that that was the movie I was watching. I'm like, this is what they came up with. Yeah. I just, there were so many problems with it. And I, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to trash it like Steve likes to do, but um, <laughs> he's known for that. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be very liberal and just say that I was disappointed. I wasn't, it did not live up to my expectations. I wanted, mm-hmm. I wanted another, uh, you know, well, you might have another chance because I think there's going to be another one. As far as I know. Oh, they're they're making it now. It's, no, it's, it's already on the way. So yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know what I don't know what the odds are that it could be any good, but he just keeps right. getting older. Yeah, right. I mean, they'll, they'll have to do something where like he's not the main dude, and he's like maybe teaching somebody or mentoring somebody or you know something. Well, he like should that. just transition to into the Sean Connery role. It's what he should do, right? Like you know, they tried to do a little bit of that. And, in the the crystal skull right because they had yeah. what's his name shia Joaquin labeouf Phoenix. was kind of oh like, shia labeouf that's right yep yep he was playing like the he was playing like the new indiana jones but like it just didn't work it didn't <laughs> and shia labeouf is a good actor but that was not a i don't think that was a good fit for him that that role or it wasn't nope. written, written well or something i don't know yeah yeah all right aaron let's hear it did we did we duplicate no, no, and luckily no duplication. Oh, yes. See, we didn't. <laughs> um, you guys wouldn't me, tell me what you picked either. <laughs> this goes back to 1997. Uh, and it's kind of in a category of, like, I should have known better anyway. But I was super hyped for Alien Resurrection. Uh, I love the Alien movies. I love all three of them. Um, you know, one and two are just... In, are just home run classics right but a lot of, three is pretty divided i love part three david fincher became one of my favorite directors and i thought the doom and gloom of part three was just palpable and then i should have known better because when you have a, a part four and it's like well we're bringing her back to life and it's like why why <laughs> yeah. I, I shouldn't have even gone to the theater you know but i did somehow i got like caught up in the hype we saw because that together in the theater. Movies. Yeah. Yeah. And I love those movies and I love Sigourney Weaver and, and I went to, we went to see that movie and it was a joke. The whole thing was a joke. It was this, the, the director, um, Jean-Pierre Jeunet, uh, he's <laughs> done other great movies kind of like with, like you were saying about Ryan Johnson, yeah. like you, when you like their other stuff, um, he did Delicatessen and city of lost children and Amelie. He's, he's a really cool French, uh, filmmaker. But I think what he did with Alien Resurrection is he said, uh, I don't like American movies. Um, this is my version of a stupid fucking American movie. Uh, it, you know, it's I'm bringing my French sensibilities and making a dumb, a big, dumb, big budget American movie. And, uh, and I'm going to just put one over on them or something. Um, they took all the mystique out of the Alien franchise, you know. Yeah. Who wrote it? Guy. Did he write it as well? I don't remember. I don't remember. I think, I think he might've though, but you know, they have the aliens in captivity and in cages and stuff. And it's like, what these, these are, these are the xenomorphs, man. You know, like you can't do that to them. It ruins the whole thing. And, um, and they did these weird quirky jokes throughout the movie. And, you know, there's a basketball scene. (laughs) I remember that. But what else can you say about that? Kind of like escape from LA. I didn't see that one. Cause I was like smarter. Maybe what I think I learned from alien resurrection though, is to take my personal feelings out of the equation. When I go to a movie, like 
keep my expectations low or neutral. I think I learned that after that movie because I was so disappointed. Uh, from then on, I was like, uh, you know, hope for the best. Hopefully they did a good job. Um, if not, you know, you have, you know, if it's, if it's a series, you have the other movies from the series and you can just kind of always have those. Nobody's going to mess with them. But from then on, I was like, you know, don't, don't get too invested in a movie. I can't always follow that, but I try to, and usually I, I stick with that. So, um, yeah, I learned a lesson from that one. Right on. Yeah, I definitely did not like part four either. It was so disappointing for all the yeah. same reasons that you're talking about. You don't want to see the aliens in a cage all well lit and see every well little lit. bit of them. It's it's so not Ugh. how they're supposed to be. It's supposed to be uh, dark, smoke, strobe light in particular. That's yeah. that's the re- that's the signature. That's the recipe for that. Right. Now they do the opposite of that now. And, and just the idea of them bringing her back to life anyway, like it it, neg- it negates you know, all of what they, what she went through in part three. And oh yeah. Like, yeah. I can, I can relate to that. There's yeah, a whole bunch of that. that yeah. That crazy? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Bring you, bring you back a character that, that died for a reason. Now, why mm-hmm. did you do that? Exactly. <laughs> How come oh when goodness. I read, um, I think you read them too, dark empire back in like 92, the star Wars comic. How come you were okay with them bringing the emperor back then? I, 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 uh, I foresaw that you were going to ask this <laughs> and I have an answer for you is that yeah. to me, that was a comic book. I don't personally, I, you know, some people who love comics might go, Hey dude, fuck you. <laughs> I, I apologize in advance, but I don't put as much weight on a four comic book miniseries that came out at whatever time as I do the motion picture of, of that. So to me, that was just like somebody's take on that to have fun with four issues or however many issues it was. And that was, that was a cool like thought experiment, but yeah. I don't really want them to do that. And they, right. then they did it. Oh <laughs> no. All right. So we had a hell of a fun V3 cast number 18. We talked about a film that we were involved in back in 2015 called portal to hell. We talked about our three October horror film picks and we uh, talked about some Voyager three news. And then we closed it out with, our most disappointing film that we've seen. We want to hear from you guys about your October picks, your scary movies. We want to hear from you very importantly about your most personally gut wrenchingly disappointing movie that you ever saw. Narrow it down to one. Be brave. That's right. That's right. There's no wrong answers. There's no, and there's no, and there's no crying in baseball. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So until next time, this has been V3 cast the official Voyager 3 podcast. We'll see you guys next time. (laughs) Settle down, Aaron. (laughs) Um, you know, feel free to edit these if I talk about them too much. I try to keep it brief, but um, you can't the help other yourself. one, I know I can't help it. I'm loquacious. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that should be in the credits. <laughs>